sing that. church as a community we agree together and we say yes we say yes we say amen as we continue to worship you God on 
Lord. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to be in such a setting as this, to see your glory in this place, to be rejuvenated, to see your true will for our lives. And thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be a part of what you are doing, to be a part of what you would like to do in our various homes, in our various communities. Thank you, Lord God, for including us in your will to reconcile man unto yourself. So we praise you, Lord God, and give you glory, and give you honor for the teachings we have heard, for your messages we've heard here today. Thank you for helping us to reconnect with you and to be in tune with your will for our lives. Now, Lord, as we prepare to go throughout the rest of this meeting and eventually go to our various homes and destinations, let us be found faithful answering your call. Let us be found faithful, Lord God, doing your work and your will. Let us be found faithful, Father God, being instruments of transformation in our communities, Lord God, that your kingdom will indeed come in our various places, that it will, become, that it will come all around us, that we would see your glory, Lord. We would see lives change, transform, and we'll be careful to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. We bless you now, Lord God, to you be all praise. In Jesus' name, we pray and we ask it all. Amen, amen, and amen. I was supposed to tell you that I'm Gerald Davis, with the Baptist General Convention of Texas, in Dallas, Texas, and I'm a newest board member. And so I look forward to serving you in this new position and thank God for the opportunity. All right, Gerald, thank you. That's right. Buenos dias, CCDA. <clears throat> We're going to make you bilingual before you leave here. I love Taco Bell. Yo quiero Taco Bell. How many of y'all have had a, just an uplifting time the last few days? Amen. 
Has the Lord spoken to you? Man, I've been so encouraged, but I've got to be honest with you. Uh, this morning, uh, the verse that came to my mind and heart was, The joy of the Lord is my strength. Okay? Because it wasn't my body that was my strength. You know, tired a little bit. That salsa dancing killed me. It was rough trying to move your hips without turning your shoulders and all that kind of stuff. That run for the third day in the road in a row almost killed me, okay? Uh, just all the things that are going on, uh, it's, it's filling, but it's draining, you know? And, and, but then I woke up, and the Lord just put that verse in my mind and in my heart, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And man, I just am full of joy. You know, just full of joy for the privilege that we have to be here together. To, to serve him and to learn together and to uh, do everything within our power to be the kind of association that would live up to what Dr. Perkins spoke about this morning, okay? We may not be about everything, but we're going to be about focusing on reaching those people that nobody else wants to reach and those communities that uh, often get neglected, Amen. Well, listen, uh, this morning we just want to do a little CCDA business. It's only going to take a couple of minutes. But the one thing I want to, I want to acknowledge, because we, I don't know that we do this very much in CCDA, but it's such an integral part of, our, uh, of urban ministry and, and ministry in the city and Christian community development. And that is the recognition of the artist among us. Okay? We have had some amazing musicians using their musical talents. Linda Jones uh, from London Community Church uh, provided these, these uh, little dramas for us every day. You know, hadn't that been great? <laughs> to speak to another part of our brain, to uplift our hearts in a different way, and to bring home a message that, you know, captivates us. The artist that made this backdrop is right here in St. Louis. And uh, using his talents uh, to do that. Uh, the, you, did you like these books this, this year? <laughs> A young man in Chicago who has been here from Mexico for 10 years. He's a legal resident. <laughs> he has his green card. He became a citizen. He went to a local college downtown to study graphic arts, and he is the one that produced this book. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Amen. You know, if you think we took a step forward to elevate that this year, wait till we get to Miami, okay? I, I got to tell you, it, I know it's going to be far. I know that it's going to be tough for some of you, you know, maybe not as many of us will be able to drive and all that, but I tell you, begin to plan now. We are going to be in this beautiful place in Miami called the Knight Center right downtown. It is a venue unlike anything we've ever had in CCDA, okay? It's going to blow your mind. We're going to celebrate, and you know, that's not how we live every day, is it? Uh, so for a week, or uh, you know, a weekend... Uh, once a year, we're going to throw a big party. All right, amen? All right. Okay. Well, one of the first page of the uh, book that you have is uh, it lists our sponsors. And I just want you to know how grateful we are to our sponsors that helped to underwrite this conference. And, uh, you know, let's give them a big hand. They're listed right here. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's amazing. I want to bring out uh, Rick Diaz right now. Uh, to represent and to share just a welcome from one of our new sponsors, new major sponsors, the DeVos Urban Leadership Initiative. Rick is the program director for this great uh, uh, organization that's doing training in cities all over the country, and I want Rick to say hi to us. Bienvenidos. That means welcome. Welcome. And I tell you what, we just praise the Lord that we're able to be a part of this wonderful, wonderful organization, uh, CCDA, and to see all the leadership and the uh, young people and all the A groups that are involved in receiving the training and the blessings. How many of you have received a blessing this week? 
Amen. Praise the Lord. And again, the, the Voss uh, Initiative is very honored to be part of this organization and representing. And also, we are very much aligned with the mission statement and the vision uh, that uh, CCDA does have. And we, again, just thank the Lord for being a part of this wonderful, wonderful venue. God bless you all, and may you have traveling mercies when you all begin to go home. And remember, what you've learned, it's a purpose. And that purpose is to take back what God is doing in your life and what you're being empowered with. To give back to those young people, to give back to those families, and to give back to those organizations. God bless you, and again, thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll see you all when? In Miami, when? Next year. Let me hear that. When in Miami? Next year. Hallelujah. You betcha. Now, does that mean you're committing tonight to be another uh, major sponsor again? It, 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 it looks like. <laughs> I don't want to get you in trouble, so you go home and talk about it, and we'll expect that for next year. All right. All right. Okay, here's the last little bit of business we want to do. We have also established a new partnership with Tech Mission, and we've been working this over the last, uh, you know, couple of years. But one of the main things we want to do is to increase the membership benefits that you get from CCDA. And working with Tech Mission... How many of you have been on our website and downloaded talks uh, from past conferences? Okay, so you can do that now. Uh, from the last years and the few years before, you can go and get every workshop, every conference. Uh, some are, are video streamed. John is on a podcast, whatever that is, okay? <laughs> and you can just click this thing and onto your little uh, eye thing, whatever. It just downloads through the air and it's amazing and you can hear John every day, all day, throughout the day, and it's free. John, they're cutting into your book business, John. Okay? We're going to try to find a way to make people pay for it. No. All right. If John could do it, he would do it. Okay? Now, let, I think we got a couple slides here that we want to show you. Now, here, here's the partnership that we have established with Tech Mission. We want to expand member benefits. Uh, again, through this urbanministry.org, CCDA, you can download all of these talks. Now, here's the next phase that, we, that they're already working on and they're coaches, coaching us on so that every workshop and every message would, if there was a PowerPoint associated or a handout, that that would also be on there as well. Imagine if you are trying to teach your leaders back home about the three R's, about relocation, about redistribution, and, you know, you want to do a little research, and you go and you can download the message, listen to it, download the PowerPoint and the handout. Would that be helpful? Okay. So technician is going to help us to do that. Now, the other thing that we're going to work really hard on, if, uh, you know, President Kennedy could say in 10 years we're going to put a man on the moon, uh, in a very short while, and I, I'm going to say by next conference, when you go onto the CCDA website, here's what I want to be able to do. That you go to a map of the United States, and you click on a, a part of a state, and then you go there, and every organization who is a member of CCDA will be listed right there. Wouldn't that be easy? So that you want to know about networking and all, you go to Illinois, you go to California, you go to Hawaii. That's where I want to do the next oh, no, institute. Right. Anybody here from Hawaii? Is there one person here? We got, we got to get, we got to invite somebody from Hawaii, okay? But there, I heard there was a couple Mexicans there, so I might, you know, have to investigate that, okay? So that directory is something that Tech Mission is going to help us to do. And then finally, uh, we're very, very excited about this. Uh, Tech Mission has this uh, volunteering, uh, christianvolunteering.org. Anybody seen that? So here's, here's the thing. Here's what we're doing. We have an intern from them full-time at CCDA. Okay, his name is Chris. He's got this ponytail and big hair, and he's skinny as a rail, and he's out there walking around. He's been coordinating all the workshop stuff. And Chris is going to contact every one of our members in our database. And he's going to help you to figure out how to get your organizational information on, onto this uh, christianvolunteering.org and so that you can talk about the needs that you have 
okay? Uh, I need a volunteer to raise me some money, to uh, tutor, to do this, to help with, you know, accounting, to help with whatever, marketing, uh, graphics, websites, you name it, you put it on there, and then we're going to try to push this out so that uh, more and more people around the country who care about the kind of things that we're doing can access that and know how to get in touch with you, okay? So, uh, expect a call, expect an email, expect some kind of communication, and we're going to try to get to every one of you that are in this room, okay? So that's another service that we're going to have. There's another slide, I think. Is there any more slides? Okay, uh, expanded benefits, all right? We are going to establish a members-only section of CCDA. Up until now, you can go to every single part of the website, no matter who you are. If you're here at this conference, you're an individual member of CCDA. So for the next year, you're going to be able to access that section. If you're an organizational member, you're going to be able to do that, okay, and all the people in your organization. Uh, we want membership to be uh, something that is valued, right? We want you to know that uh, to be a member means something, and so we are going to try to create more and more uh, benefits so that uh, members-only section, uh, discounted insurance, uh, there's an after-school software that will be free, group buying, discounts, uh, FedEx, Office Max, other uh, 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 companies. And then there's a technology and ministry packet and CD that uh, I think uh, provides things like filters and other kind of deals that you can use for your technology, okay? So those are the kind of, of, of things that uh, uh, we're trying to do. Do you think that'd be helpful? Okay. But here's the thing. You have to take advantage of it, and then you have to keep telling us what you need. How can we as an association you know, uh, find those resources so that you can focus on what you do best, which is ministering to people that really need to know about God and to be, have their lives empowered, okay? So uh, as, an, as an association, that's our commitment to you. We want to keep growing. We want to keep increasing our ability to be a resource to you. We're not here trying to make a name for ourselves. Somebody the other day, uh, yesterday was out there saying, you know, well, what does CCDA do? I said, we don't do anything except for support the people that are here that are on the front lines doing the work. Okay? That's it. Uh, we want to uh, decrease in a sense in that way so that you all might increase. All right? That's our, that's our vision. That's our goal, and that's the purpose of the association. So uh, I really want to just tell you, do, would you please uh, tell your friends. I mean, get the word out. Get other churches. Get other leaders. Get other ministries that you know. How many people that you know that weren't here this week you think would benefit from uh, experiencing what you experienced this week? Is there some folks out there that you think might have experienced, you know, benefited? Listen, get them to Miami. I am telling you, if you miss Miami, uh, you're going to be sorry, okay? Really, because it's warm in Miami <laughs> in October. God bless you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we are very privileged in this next section here to uh, have Lynn Jackson with us. Uh, if you were here in the 98 conference when we had it here in St. Louis, you might remember that we'd made a special uh, time where we went over on the old courthouse steps, which is where the Dred Scott decision was uh, rendered many, many years ago. And uh, we had a time of confession, a time of prayer, a time of just being together around the idea and the things that happened during the Dred Scott decision 150 years ago. And uh, we're going to bring before you this morning uh, Lynn Jackson, who is the great-great-granddaughter of Dred Scott, and this is the 150th anniversary of the Dred Scott decision. And so the Dred Scott Heritage Foundation is what Lynn has set up to bring more awareness to this. I mean, some of you all may have heard the name Dred Scott, but you might not even really know what it's about. Some of you may not even have heard it, it's, and some of you know it well. But we want to bring before you this morning Lynn Jackson to give her a few minutes to talk about what God is doing in her life. So would you please welcome Lynn Jackson.
Good morning. What a beautiful crowd. Well, I'm so pleased to be here, and I have to thank Dr. Perkins and Andy for the invitation. Well, I have had just an, a whole life change with the anniversary of Dred Scott. And can I ask a show of hands, how many people know who this person is? Wow, that's pretty good. That is pretty good, because there's so many times when I talk to people, and you would think that they would know, and they have a blank stare on their face. But I'm going to give you just a little interview so that, uh, overview so that those who didn't raise your hand will have a little better idea of what we're referring to. Dred Scott was a, well, we like to say an enslaved man. They say he was a slave. But he was an enslaved man who had been taken to free territory twice in his life, to the Wisconsin Territories and also into Illinois. Those were free states. And Missouri had a law that said once free, always free. If you go into a free state, you were deemed a free person. Well, he stayed with his master at the time, who was Dr. Emerson, and he was an Army surgeon. Dr. Emerson brought him back to St. Louis. And when he died and passed away, Dred had decided, well, you know, I think maybe we'll try to get free. He and his wife, Harriet, who is um, a very strong woman, I have studied and learned so much more about her. She and he both have saved money. They saved about $300 and offered to buy their freedom from her. And she refused because she felt that this was her source of income and she wasn't going to let it go. So the only other recourse was to go to the courts, and they did. Um, there were five trials over 11 years, and during that time, <coughs> I'm getting a little bit of a sore throat this morning, I'm sorry. During that time, they won the second case because the first one was put off for hearsay. They won and they were freed by 12 white men, a jury of 12. That was a wonderful day, except for Mrs. Emerson turned around and decided she would appeal it immediately. They took that to the Supreme Court of Missouri, and they lost. And then went to the Supreme Court of the United States. And in 1857, on April the 6th, I'm sorry, March 6th, it was determined that blacks had no rights that white men were bound to respect. And that is the phrase that most people associate with the Dred Scott case. And of course, this just took the North and South and split it further in half and was one of the major catalysts for the Civil War. The good news in the story, though, is that about six weeks later, Taylor Blow, who was the son of his original owner, the family into which he was born, was able to get freedom bonds and free them. That's a, a very interesting part of the story, and I don't have time for it today. But I do encourage you to go out on the Internet and just look up Dred Scott, and you'll find that. And you'll also find so many other things and probably end up learning a lot more about black history. It's very fascinating. But it's not just black history. It's our history. So I'd like to encourage people to get out there and, and see what that was about. But that happened at the old courthouse across the street. And this year marks the 150th anniversary. It was uh, 1995 that the Lord absolutely just kind of knocked me on the head and said, wake up, wake up. That's your great-great-grandfather. How much do you really know about him? And I thought, yeah, I should know more than the average person. So I went out on a quest, and I ended up with about 12 three-ring binders of information and research material, which continues to grow. And I'm so in love with this story. Um, my father, who I obviously love very dearly, John Madison, he always carried the torch for the family, and he passed away this summer, but not before May 26th. And on May 26th, it was 150 years of the day that they got their freedom. And we were able to take the street between Chestnut and Pine, which is just this block and the next. I hope you've seen it. And change 4th Street to Dred Scott Way. And this was a wonderful thing for us. Thank you. <laughs> to me, that's the highlight of the year. Even though I've spoken between um, D.C. with the Attorney Generals and I have the Missouri Bar and uh, I was on C-SPAN and God has just opened up doors. And I have to give him thanks and praise because this is a God thing. I tell everybody that. And I'm happy to do that. I'm with people who understand that better than my average audience. Because every morning I wake up and I say, Lord, what are we going to do today? And I just kind of wait for my marching orders. And every day is an adventure. So uh, to God be the glory. This is absolutely his time. It's his program. It's his purpose. So I'm um, very happy, very willing, very humbled to be a part of it. And not only a part, I guess... I have a brother who's passed away, another brother and two sisters, and I have cousins, but it just appears that it's my task to do this. So um, I'm pleased, I'm happy, and the Dred Scott Heritage Foundation was founded last June. I am actually a general services manager for Brian Cave Law Firm, and Brian Cave is one of the largest law firms in the country and in the world, actually. 
Uh, it's in that very tall, beautiful marble building across the street on the top 10 floors. And so I do have a full-time job, and they have been wonderful to let me come and go and do whatever. Uh, somebody told me they saw one of our attorneys over here the other day with a booth, so I don't know who you are, but if you're out there, I'd sure love to know who that is. appreciate that you're part of this as well. So I really praise God and thank them for my position at Bryant Cave. Uh, a real quick irony, and then I'll move on to the next thing, is that um, Dred Scott worked for Roswell Field, and that was the attorney that took his case to the Supreme Court. He worked there as a janitor, so I like to tell people that he and I both worked for law firms. A little bit of a difference there, but I think that's a cute connection. Okay, so what are we doing here today, or what am I doing here today? I guess it was uh, about a year ago, Harold Hendrick, and if he's out there, I love you so much. He's one of our radio personalities and pastors at large here in St. Louis. He knew Dr. Perkins, and he connected me with him. Dr. Perkins actually was so gracious, not even knowing me, agreed to be an honorary coach here for our anniversary. So he is a part of our organization, which means so are you. <laughs> and in meeting him, we were able to discuss the fact that uh, my purpose dovetails with his that we don't want to just have an anniversary year where we say okay you know uh, okay our goals are education commemoration and reconciliation but we want to do more okay when March comes we plan to have a gala dinner here in St. Louis to wrap that year up more or less but then what we don't want to just have had all these wonderful events and then it would die away so even though I don't know if I know what I'm doing I founded a foundation and we're going to try to move into another phase of that, which I call the reconciliation phase. We've actually called it racial reconciliation. I think we're still going to figure out what, which way to go. But there is no reconciliation if we haven't reconciled our hearts with Jesus Christ. And therefore, that's where we need to start. And that's why I'm here. I'm here to thank you to be a part, for being a part of this organization that has that heart for working with urban communities and uh, just wanting Jesus to be a part of everything. The uh, secular world accepts to hear about this a little bit, but they're, they're sometimes you can see on their faces, too, that they don't quite get that. So, um, so that's where we're going to go from here. One of the things I'm really excited about in St. Louis is the fact that I have been asked about five years ago to be on the board of Mission Metro St. Louis. And Mission Metro St. Louis is a part of Mission America, which I believe you probably are aware of what that is. And Mission America in St. Louis, actually, though, is our purpose is to bring the Church of St. Louis together. And so I belong actually to a Southern Baptist church in Florissant. And it is, well, it was headed by Jim Savage. And now we have a brand new pastor, Jeff Wells. It's a wonderful church. Um, the people there are very giving, very warm. I think we have like maybe a 10% African American population at that church. We're in a neighborhood that's just booming and booming with new housing, even though it's not a new neighborhood, but there's just been a lot of beautiful land that was undeveloped. So our mission there is to integrate that very integrated neighborhood into our churches. And many of the people on Mission Metro have made a personal commitment to go to churches that are of different nationalities and different cultures because Jesus said, John 17, may they be one as you and I are one. And that's our purpose and goal and focus. The other nice thing that I'm a part of is our Global Day of Prayer in St. Louis. And I'm on the review board, I guess just by virtue of the fact of being there. I think I'm the only woman on the board right now, so we have to fix that. But um, who participates in Global Day of Prayer? Do you have Global Day of Prayer in your cities? Oh, you must go back and fix that. Oh, my goodness. Uh, look it up, globaldayofprayer.org. Uh, it's out there on the Internet. I don't have time to go into that, but it started in Africa with their revival, and they invited the world to pray with them on Pentecost Sunday. And we've been doing that at Bush Stadium for the last three years. And again, it's another effort to bring Christ to the forefront with all of his people and all of the, um, all of the races. So with that purpose in mind, um, we're actually going to have a five-year program, and we've had maybe about 3,000 people each year. Our goal is to fill up Bush Stadium. That's a tough one, but we're persisting with it. And all of this is because God has a purpose. I was very happy to hear about the fact that you all prayed at the courthouse in 1998. And I'm sure that there are others who have, and I don't know about it. But this year also, a group of intercessors came through St. Louis. They're actually praying down the Mississippi River and all of its tributaries for this land. And when they came to St. Louis, they asked me to come over, and they prayed, and we prayed. And it was the most amazing thing I've ever been a part of. And, you know, God actually showed up that day. He really did. I know sometimes people say, what does that mean? And I'm sure it means different things at different times, but he was very evident and very prominent that day. 
And so St. Louis has been marked by many as a place of significance for so many reasons. We're in the center of the country. Um, we, are, we were a state that was pro-slavery and anti-slavery. We were a divided state. And so there are those who believe that St. Louis is going to be a place of revival, that it may start here. We don't know what God has exactly in mind, but we're here and we're doing whatever we can. So the Dress God anniversary has been a wonderful vehicle. The timing, of course, is God's appointed time. It's one of my favorite phrases. It's his appointed time at the time appointed. And so none of us are here by accident. You know that. I'm not telling you anything new. But whatever your purpose is, I definitely admonish you to get in it and do it and teach others the same because we don't know what tomorrow brings. I'm not sure how I'm going to go forward with this reconciliation program except to say that in part our education of the Dred Scott history has been wonderfully well received and we hope to have a statue of Dred Scott across the street in Keener Plaza. That's our goal. We don't know exactly if it's going to be there and exactly when, but we will have a statue of Dred in this city. And then also we hope to have a facility because Dred Scott does not have a place that is a memorial to him. The old courthouse is a St. Louis courthouse with St. Louis history, and Dred Scott case is the most important uh, case that was ever held. So obviously that is their, their star. But we would like to have one just for Dred and Harriet as well, and then it would be a reconciliation center as well. So those are our goals in, in a nutshell, and we would ask very much for your prayer and support in these efforts because uh, we're just going out on a walk of faith. You know, I don't really know what next year is going to bring, but I know who's going to bring it, and I intend to be there and do whatever I can. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. God bless you, and do come back to St. Louis. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you, Keith. Uh, well, this morning, we are, I think, in for a, a, a rare treat where we are going to uh, have a conversation up here on the stage in front of you, but we're, it's going to be more like we're in Leroy's living room uh, and just talking about their relationship and what God has been doing in that. And so we just encourage you to, to listen into this conversation and to be a part of it uh, through listening. And because this is really what CCDA is all about. It's the relational part of it, reconciliation, coming together, building strong relationships. And so we're just going to have a, a conversation together the, this morning. And I think that uh, our goal would certainly be that all of us here would would gain some insights and that we would be blessed from that. And so we want to just jump right in and do that. Um, we have uh, Andy Krumzig and Leroy Gill here, and uh, they're here in St. Louis. And Andy, Andy, of course, uh, I've known quite well because Andy was uh, with us in Lawndale for close to 10 years and lived in Chicago. And so just a, a sad day for us, Andy, when you left Lawndale, but how exciting it is to see what's been happening here for a dozen years now in St. Louis. So, uh, Andy, why don't you just maybe share with us a little bit of the process of what happened? How in the world, what happened? Was it the bad boss or, or the, you know, what wasn't, what, why did you leave Lawndale and get to St. Louis? How did that all happen? Well, uh, it happened at a CCDA conference, actually. Uh, the fifth conference in Jackson in 1993, I believe it was. Um, we had, I, I guess for the uh, year previous, I had been working on some things, been in Lawndale for seven years or so, 
and was starting to understand more and more that there were some questions that needed to be asked. And hearing folks like Tom Skinner, uh, other folks that would challenge me, um, I thought, hmm, I, I don't think I understand this thing like I thought I understood it. And at the Jackson Conference, um, make a long story short, uh, the Friday morning I was having my quiet time. And um, there's been three times in my life when I've known the Lord, quote unquote, said something to me. It wasn't an audible voice, but it was clear as a bell. Some of you all have sensed that before. You know when God's saying something to you. And uh, the words that I heard was, why don't you move to St. Louis and start a ministry? And uh, what I understood with that was, first off, the bottom of my stomach dropped out. I felt sick, and I thought, no way. You've got to be kidding, God. The only thing I knew about St. Louis was I was born there. My mom's side of the family had grown up there, and it was hot and sweaty in the summertime. <laughs> and, uh, but when I, when I began to think about it, I thought, you know what? What God is asking me to do is the same thing that we ask a lot of young African Americans and a lot of young Hispanics. And hey, Go back to your neighborhood and help rebuild your community. And I knew a little bit about the neighborhood. I knew it was African American. I knew it was poor. I knew it was just like Lawndale. It was so similar to Lawndale, it was almost spooky. And uh, I remember when we had buried my grandpa uh, several years earlier, we had driven through the old neighborhood, and I told my wife, I said, Debbie, no wonder I feel so at home in Lawndale. It's because my roots are in the city. And so uh, I just, I, I knew God was saying, go to St. Louis. I didn't know in what capacity, but I knew I had to figure it out, and I knew I had two choices. One was obedience or disobedience. Obedience is much more comfortable in the long run, though sometimes it's not comfortable at the beginning. Yeah. So. All right. Well, thanks, Andy, for kind of letting us in on that. And, and of course, uh, somehow you got, had to get into relationship with this uh, gentleman right here. And uh, Leroy, uh, just tell us a little bit of what was, what was uh, going on in your life before Andy got here and what was going on right about the time Andy got here. Tell us a little bit about you. Um, what was going on in my life is uh, God had been impressing on my heart about uh, reconciliation. Um, I hadn't gone to any conferences or anything like that, but I was impacted by the civil rights movement. Dr. Martin Luther King had a profound uh, influence on my life, um, going through high school, learning about the history of this country, and, and after becoming a Christian, uh, I began to see that there was something wrong in the body of Christ. And God was, uh, uh, well, a thought came to my mind, well, if, the, if, if Dr. Martin Luther King could rally people around the civil rights uh, across racial and denominational lines and, uh, and, and hearing this gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, why not the church? Mm. Why am I going to an all African American church? I love my church and all that, but... God was really dealing with my heart about reconciliation. Even yeah. though I didn't understand it, right? but right. Uh, God was really tugging my heart towards it. Had you had many experiences with white people uh, up until the time you got to know Andy? What was going on? Did you have some... Uh, what was happening with white people and you? <laughs> uh, I mean, I went to, went to high school with, with white folks. Uh, growing up in St. Louis, uh, it was... Uh, definitely, St. Louis is a different place. Uh, I mean, divided uh, racially. I grew up with that. Um, grew up in the project, so understanding, you know, that uh, I was limited. Uh, but I was blessed because my mom never taught us to be racist. Uh, uh, but so then prior to Andy coming, I was uh, in... A ministry relationship with a with an organization uh, that was um, different, you know. I kind of describe that white lead, uh, white lead. Yeah, that's one of the differences, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. It was different, all right. Yeah, a, a little paternalistic, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, had good intentions, uh, but they, uh, you know, again, like a lot of white organizations, they come to our community and they have all the answers. Yeah. Uh, but again, their heart was right. So uh, meeting Andy was really, uh, and again, I want to say this too, is that even though the organization was a little paternalistic, uh, God allowed me not to fall out with people. Yeah. And yeah. that's what happens to a lot of people. You fall out with people. Mm -hmm. Don't ever do that. 
Uh, but Andy really was uh, uh, fresh wind. Tell us how you met Andy. Here's this white oh, guy. Yeah. Here's, here's what I just heard. Andy's <laughs> this white guy. He's up here in Chicago. He senses God telling him at a CCDA conference, go to St. Louis back where your roots were, and, so, and go to a black neighborhood. So he comes in here. Now, somehow the two of you are sitting down. Let me, let me start, and then you finish. Oh, you're going to tell us. You know, white people are always oh, trying oh, to take over, right, you know? Okay, I ask Leroy a question, a white guy answers. But you're going to let him do it. You're going to let him do that, Leroy? Is that okay? Uh, yeah, go ahead. All right, all right. All right, we got Leroy's permission. Go ahead, I'm only going to take a few seconds. All right. Had come to St. Louis and heard about Leroy. Went back home. Now, how, who told you about Leroy? What do you mean you heard about Leroy? Uh, at the CCDA conference, met some people that had been at the CCDA conference, were working in St. Louis with an organization that Leroy was, was affiliated with, and they knew Leroy. Good relationships were okay, happening. So they okay? told you about this guy. Yeah. I right. called him up. I, they, I said, well, you got his phone number? I called him up. They don't know me. I don't know them. And I, I called him up, and I started talking. I was talking with Donna. And Donna's I, his wife? Donna's Leroy's wife. I ended up inviting myself to their house. White people do that, don't they? You know? <laughs> Look who's coming to dinner. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, Leroy, tell us, could you please tell us how you met Andy? <laughs> Thank you, Coach. Uh, uh, when I met Andy, uh, it, it, I knew God was calling us to back to the city, uh, but I was a little green. I, I didn't have any principles. I, I didn't know what to do. I, I just had a call. Mm -hmm. And to meet Andy, uh, when I met him, you know, this white guy, I mean, Andy has vision. I mean, Andy, you know, he talks fast, he moves fast, and, and, but uh, I was just listening because, again, I, I just come out of a relationship that was kind of different. So I got my, my antennas up. But Andy knew where he was going, mm -hmm. you know, which really impressed me. Uh, uh, and so uh, as I listened to him, uh, and because I knew what I wanted to do but didn't have the principles, I had to listen. Mm -hmm. And what he said and what he was sharing, and those the CCDA principles, resonated with my heart. Uh, so... Uh, and again, you know, sometimes, even as African Americans, uh, we don't want to listen. Yeah. You know? uh, uh, and so I was able to hear what he has to say. And what he said made sense. What, what about it made sense? What was, what was resonating with you? Uh, well, now, now the reconciliation part was a little tough at first. What was tough about it? Uh, well, as an African American, I was taught upward mobility. I mean, you're in a, a poor neighborhood, get out of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And that's the trek that my wife and I were on. And so uh, the reconciliation part was, was difficult. Uh, but again, I, I didn't know where I was going. So I, I just had to become a listener. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So Andy, c continue on. How did you now then you know, obviously you're in a good relationship now. You've been in a dozen years together. What, how did it get started? What's the beginning foundational pieces? A lot of it was uh, sitting and talking. When I came to St. Louis, I, I, I wasn't, I would come from Lawndale. Uh, I was, like Leroy says, I move fast, I talk fast, some of that kind of stuff. But I knew I wasn't going to clone Lawndale. I knew we weren't supposed to recreate Lawndale, but I knew there was principles behind some things, and God was going to do what he was going to do in St. Louis and we need to hear what God has to say. He had to learn that. I, I, he, he, he didn't just come overnight? No, no. He, he thought he was going to bring it all here? Yeah, he was, he was trying to... Well, wait a minute, Andy, hold on. Let's get, let's get a little more of that. Well, I got tell, us now. tell us a little bit about that, Leroy. <laughs> what, tell us how he came with that. What's today's theme? Something about beyond, show Jesus beyond paternalism? <laughs> yep, 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 yep. Uh, tell us a little bit how Andy came. Uh, again, like, like most white folks, they have good intentions. Um... Isn't there a road somewhere paved with good intentions? <laughs> <laughs> and he, he was a little pushy, mm -hmm. you know, but he was dealing with a strong black man. Yeah. I knew who I was. I didn't need Andy. 
to do ministry. Uh, black folks will do ministry at any cost. Uh, but uh, he was a little pushy, so it was up to me to slow him down. Uh, and, and that's how the relationship, you know, really began. Uh, it was, it, it began with him pushing, and, and, and again, I'm saying, I didn't know much. Yeah. But I had to still be a learner of what he was saying, but I had to, you know, kind of slow the brother down. And yeah. I had thought I had already slowed down a little bit. That was my problem. I needed to slow down some more. Mm -hmm. I needed to listen to some more. And it was, it was difficult for me. And and even at the beginning, I was full-time vocational in ministry. Leroy was running a lawn care business. He was out there every day, and he was pastoring by vocational. So many African-American pastors are by vocational and, and carrying on the ministry, but got to support their families. And so we used, sometimes I used to come out to the lawn, the grass-cutting sites, where the yards were Leroy was working on. Sometimes we'd meet at his house. Sometimes he'd meet at my house. The first night I arrived in St. Louis, I'll never forget the first night in St. Louis, uh, Leroy and his friend Harry Walls, Pastor Harry Walls here in St. Louis, they came by. We're on, you know, starting to unpack. We're the white folks, task going. You got to get this stuff unpacked. Got to move. Gotta... And then Leroy and Harry show up and they want to pray. Okay, I'm good for praying, but let's go. Let's just do this fairly quickly and let's move on, you know. And, but we went over and we had a time in prayer that I will never forget. We laid on the floor. We prayed. They brought something. They, they, they were checking me out to a certain degree, okay? But they brought something that was relational. It was no program about that, no task about that. We spent time together. It was time without an end to it. There was no plan for it. And I'll never forget that first night. That put us off on the right step. And even from the very beginning, he helped me learn a lot more about sitting down, relaxing, and just spending time together. Mm -hmm. We did a lot of that for. Yeah. We, don't, we keep doing a lot of that because yeah. the relationship's not built; it's in progress. Now, now, did did you go to uh, the church that he was pastoring ever in those uh, early this days? This is good. This is good. Uh, Leroy was pastoring, and um, it was it was in relationship with the organization I had come and been with, and and uh, I wanted to be part of that because our goal was to plant churches. It was great, you know. We wanted to plant churches. And so a partnership was developed. I thought, I need to go to the church where Leroy's pastoring. And he was pastoring in the city, living in the county. Uh, we call it the county in St. Louis for you who think it's the suburbs. It's the county, okay? But uh, he'd come in on Sundays or come in for the things that we were doing. And uh, first service, there's about, oh, 20, 25 people, including the kids. And then the kids had time to go out. And there's about six or eight people, maybe 10 at the most, and, his, uh, wife, you, his wife, your wife, me, Debbie. Wife, yeah. you know, you okay. know, we all know the situation. And I'm, I'm sitting there. There's, a, there's probably, I don't know, 40 chairs set up in nice straight rows. Y'all can do some straight rows. You know, those black folks do straight rows. And, and uh, so I'm sitting there, and Leroy starts to preach. And I go, who's he preaching to? It's just a few of us here. And he's preaching like he's preaching to 300 people. And I thought, why don't we just kind of sit around in a circle and have a Bible study? <laughs> kumbaya. Kumbaya. Yeah, let's kumbaya. <laughs> yeah, all right. And I, at that time, I thought, you know what? This guy is a good was preacher. He, was he a good preacher? He's a good preacher. He's a man of God. His fan I thought, we got to get some more people to hear him preach. All right. So... That was the beginning. That was kind of the beginning of the planting of the church. Huh? Yeah. Was that sermon, by the way, Leroy, aimed right at Andy? Did you remember that? No, 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 no. no. All right, all right. Well, now, tell us about now. Now the, the situation is, Leroy, you're pastor of Jubilee Community Church. Andy, you're the executive director of Jubilee Development Corporation. So you've partnered together. You've planted a church. I know there's a lot of stuff about that that we could talk about, but we're just going to skip over that mm -hmm. because we want to focus in on your relationship. That's what we want to learn from you because obviously you're, you're, you're doing it. So now, when you, what, what, after being in this for a dozen years, how are you staying strong in your relationship? Why is it still... Why are, you still in, why are you still in a relationship with this fast-talking, fast-walking, fast-moving, knuckle-headed <laughs> white man? I can say that because I'm white, all right? Yeah. 
Um, Andy loves God. All right. He loves God. And um, in those formative years, we knew we were called to be together. And um, I got Andy's back. And I know Andy got my back. All right. Can you tell us a time that you know that you f for the f figured out that Andy had your back? Is there, a, is there an illustration, is there a situation that something was going on and Andy had your back? Can you tell us about that that you can remember? Yeah, I remember when, um, when we started out um, and people began to, to embrace our vision. And when people would call the ministry, a lot of white folks would call the ministry and they wanted to do all these wonderful things. And Andy, because of, of who he was and, and what he understood as far as the principles of CCDA, he would protect our community mm. from white folks who had good intentions. Okay. And again, I'm listening. Uh, I come out of a bad relationship. I'm listening. Who is this guy? But he was solid in, in, what, in those principles. Right. And so I knew, uh, again, even today, I, I'm still a listener. Uh, uh, and when he alters, <laughs> uh, I correct him because I love him. Uh, so that's yeah, it. yeah, okay. Andy, there, what? There's, there's got to be. There's got to be the. I, I can think of something a couple weeks ago. Uh, we were working. We're working on finishing up our building. Uh, yeah, and God's just blessed you with a, uh, a brand new church building that you've renovated, and gonna, is it next week, your anniversary, I mean, your, your uh, yeah. celebration for Dedication. all of that, and, you, and I, I had the privilege of being in the building, uh, Andy took me to it on Tuesday when I flew into St. Louis, and uh, you've got that church, Andy helped build that church that's got, you're going to see more than 300 people in there, aren't you, that Amen. it can preach it. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Right. We were, we were, we were working, you know, at the end, you know, building projects are always a pain in the neck. Uh, they always create conflict and tension, especially at the end. And especially when you got committees. We don't have very many committees, but Leroy and I and Pastor Badley, are, we're a committee ourselves. And sometimes we don't talk as much as we should. And we were trying to make a decision on some carpet. And I had from the very beginning, this is what we were going to do. You know, God gave us these things, da, 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 da. And we're starting to go through this process. And, and, uh, and then we went through a chair process. Okay, we're thinking about what do we do with these chairs? Well, I, you know, I can live with anything. You know, we can sit on the floor, whatever. Leroy's got, you know, we need the excellence and all. He's good for me. He balances me. And we're making this decision about chairs. And he, he was going one direction, and I'm kind of going the other direction. And I, could, I had a hard time sleeping that night. And the next morning, we got together, and we talked about it. And when we talked about it, we realized we weren't far away from each other. We just hadn't talked. And I think it's extremely important. We have to talk. And we can, what happens is I was starting to take this little thing that was definitely a difference. It was an irritation. It may or may not have been a black thing, white thing. It could have been very much personality kind of thing. But I was taking this little thing that was right here and all it needed to do was to get brushed out of the way with a broom or whatever. And I was starting to build it up. I was starting to assume things. And Leroy was getting worse and worse and worse in my mind. And it was, it was, it was messing with my heart. And I had, the next morning, we went and talked. And I, it, it, as we talked, it went like this. And then we went, kicked it out of the way. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a conflict anymore mm -hmm. because we talked. Now, I, is, as you're talking together uh, intentional, do you have intentional times, Leroy, that you and Andy are going to be together? Or is it just a little bit more when you feel you need to? How do you do your, com your communicating? At the beginning, we set times aside uh, because we knew we had to connect. Uh, and now it's, uh, it's just frequent. It's, uh, What's frequent mean? Um, whenever we need to. How often is that? Uh, usually, usually when a conflict <laughs> All right. And how often are the conflicts there? Uh, not as much as they used to be. All right. <laughs> uh, uh, we sit and talk sometimes a couple times a week. Sometimes it's a couple weeks before we talk. You know? 
It, it just it varies. It really. Do you varies. like it when Leroy comes into your office to talk to you, Andy? Oh, sometimes. Sometimes I got too much to do to talk. I can be at my computer, and he and he and Larry will come in. And they'll Who's sit, Larry? Larry's assistant pastor, Larry Bradley. He's a wonderful brother, and actually, he almost should be up here. We're like a three-fold three cord, you know? Yeah, yeah. We, Leroy and I had a good thing going, and Larry came and made it so much better. All right. There's three of us. He gives us another perspective, too. Is Larry, uh, what, is Larry, what race is Larry? Larry's African-American. African-American. So, so you kind of make an Oreo cookie. cookie. Yeah, All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, but good. sometimes they'll... You know what, Andy? You must be one rough white man. We need to take two black men to keep you in line. Amen. Yeah, Leroy do. You keep saying Leroy's a wise man, you know? All right. So anyways, especially in the last couple years, because Larry and I, as, as our relationship, as, as the three of us have grown in our relationship, uh, Larry and I had... We butted heads a bunch several years ago, and we, I was polite. I would keep being polite. I keep stuffing these things inside of me, and sometimes... And our relationship wasn't where it should be. So uh, over the past couple of years, I don't know if they schemed up to do this thing or if it just happened naturally who they are, because it probably just happened naturally. You know what? In a minute, I can ask him if it was a scheme, but uh, go ahead. But they would come in my office, and I have a common office. There's about three of us in the office, and they have private offices. And we're getting, I'm going to have a private office when we go to the new building. It'll be nice. <laughs> but anyways, um, they would come in, and they would sit down in two chairs there, and I'd be here at my desk in credenza and typing away, doing things. And I'm thinking, I hope they're not going to stay here very long. <laughs> I got too much to do. They're out talking to folks, and I got to keep on typing and send these letters and make these phone calls. And... But what's happened in the last two years is I really have learned how to relax a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And I've learned more about relationship. And Larry's in my relationship is a million percent better. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. horrible, but it's very good now. It was, mm -hmm. it was, it was a good relationship, but yeah. it wasn't very good. Now it's very good. And if you don't mind, Coach, I like to respond, um, you know, even that, like that carpet deal. And I, and I know this is not Andy Hart, but I, I think it's the heart of a lot of white people who come to our community. Some of them don't think that uh, the, the inner city should have nice things. You know, uh, I remember when Dr. Perkins was talking about going to a ministry and there was trash, you know, beautiful facility, but trash. And, and, and sometimes white folks, they struggle. Uh, I mean, I, that, that's a whole dialogue about why. <laughs> but uh, they why struggle. Do we, why do we struggle? We'd like to hear that. Uh. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Dr. Perkins wants to know. You always saying talk. <laughs> yeah. Talk to me. Well, I think they struggle, obviously, because of the history of this country, uh, the racial things. And I also think uh, it is a way to raise more funds to keep the community, in a sense, uh, looking poor. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, I mean, even with the brochures that go out, yeah. you're usually going to see white folks huddering over some children or woman. Hardly ever you see African American men in a strong position mm -hmm. on their literature. And they appeal to uh, the Christian society to give more, give more, give more. And how do you feel about that as an African American man when you see that? I feel patronized. Uh, but I thank God I understand it. So white folks have to change their thinking. Mm -hmm. And the African American brothers, we have to stay strong. And we need to have ministries of excellence. Yeah. Because it's God yeah. who's yeah. providing and not white folks. Now, so when Andy, yeah, that's, that's good. So in your relationship with Andy, when you would sense that coming out of him, tell us the process of how you would 
handle that? You sense it in any of those ways you talked about. I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm, I confront. I mean, because I don't want anything to harbor in my heart. See, I know Andy loves God. All right. That's the foundation. Yeah. Andy loves that community. All that I know. And that's why I got his back. And that's why he has my back. He had a rapport in our community before I did. Uh, so uh, I confront. I, I have to. Uh, because uh, it's going to offend the community. Because mm -hmm. the community, our goal is to reach people in our community. And, and if we're called to do that, then it's not about us. Yeah. So it's how do you confront Andy in that? Tell us, about, tell us about how you do it. I mean, I don't know how to explain it other than I... I, I, I well, well, there is a process. Thanks for asking. But there is a process. I have to pray. All right. Because I know he loves God. I have to... So I can come across in a way that glorifies God and not judge him. We get to the issue, but the way I come is very important because I don't want to hurt him because I, I know his heart. Just, just keeping it real. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, maybe I add a little bit on that too because I think Leroy does pray. When something's on his heart, he prays about it. And sometimes he prays about it on the way to talking to you about it. Yeah. And it's, a, it's not a long, drawn-out kind of thing. It's, it's a, let's deal with this thing. And this could be maybe a black-white thing. Sometimes, you know, look, let's, say, let's talk about this black-white thing a minute. Sometimes we say that's black and that's white. And it's not. It's not color. Yeah. It's economics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, education. It's other kinds of things that we'll lump in a black-white thing. Now, there are things that are black and white. Maybe this is, this is part of it, but maybe it's, I don't know, let me not ramble. Edu at least educated white folks will try to um, negotiate this thing. We'll try to figure it out. We'll try to make sure everybody is not getting their feelings hurt. We'll talk a lot. I get verbose a lot of times. He says, Andy, get to the point. <laughs> <laughs> folks in the hood in the neighborhood, especially blacks to blacks, they're loud, they laugh a lot, they have a good time together, they confront one another, they can holler at each other, and that's not at least the way me and my wife do it at home, I don't know, or the way that I do it with my brothers and sisters, or the way that I grew up. Again, maybe this isn't a black-white thing, this is just with Leroy and Andy, you know? But what really helps is Leroy is Let's get to the bottom of it. Let's not drag this thing out. Let's get to a solution where I could let it go on and on mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. on. Because I'm trying to be patient. Because I'm trying to be loving nice. and nice. Yeah. 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 Thank you for not being like me. Yeah. Thank you for being you. Mm -hmm. Because that gets us further down the road to where we need to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Now, Andy, uh, y you told me that, I remember when you were heading down here to St. Louis, you told me that God had told you to go back. You've sensed God's call, as John talked about in the Bible study this morning, sensed God's call to come to St. Louis, and you also sensed God's call that you were going to be in relationship with a black man, mm -hmm. and you were going to have a good relationship, right? Mm -hmm. Tell us just a little bit about that. I, from the very beginning, when I knew God was saying, I said, God, I'll go. I don't think you want me to be the pastor. I've been a white pastor in Chicago. I think, no, no, I'm a white pastor. No, no, no. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Gord's a great pastor. Uh, but uh, seriously, I knew I was coming to a community where I had been born, but I was not supposed to be the pastor. I knew I had more of a developer's heart, though I had a, I had a bit of a pastor's heart, but more of a developer's heart. And... I knew I could pastor. I knew I could do if that's what God wanted me to do. I knew I could do it, but I didn't sense that was what it was. I said, God, would you please connect me with an African-American man who loves you, whose family's there, who loves his wife, all the other kind of things like that. I said, you know, would you please do that? I don't know how you're going to do it, but just reveal it. And 
He'll be the pastor. I'll, he can be the Ezra. I'll be the Nehemiah. And what God did when he put us together was, ne Leroy's got a lot of developer in him, but he's, got, he's the heart of a pastor. I've got a lot of pastor in me, but I'm the heart of a developer. And he's, mm -hmm. he's helped us to balance each other out so that sometimes I can help him pastor a little bit, mm -hmm. and sometimes he can help me develop a little bit. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Uh, how, did you, how did it feel to be the project of a white man? That he says, I'm going to get me a black friend. All right? <laughs> he calls you before he even moves down. All right? How did that feel? Can you remember some of that? Do you remember ever feeling a little bit that way? Yeah, I, mean, I, I felt that way. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't think I, I felt like I was a project because, I mean, I was learning through the process. Again, I didn't know much, um, but uh, Andy, I, I still go back to the call. <laughs> As when we're called, we are called to a task, and whatever circumstances, troubles, trials, tribulations, it's just part of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And part of that was to be seen in a different light by white folks, or by Andy. That's part of it. Yeah. I just couldn't internalize it. It couldn't circumvent the call because there, there's pain in ministry. Yeah. And people want ministry without pain. People want reconciliation without pain. And mm -hmm. it don't work. Yeah. yeah. We need to go back to Calvary. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's painful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But again... I love him. He loves the Lord. That's, that's really as the fact. I'm repeating that, but he loves God. Yeah. Uh, a a that, white that man that moves important. his family he down into the black community. I know some black folks won't do that. <laughs> so that had to be a commitment from God. Yeah. It takes God to do that. So a lot of times I had to get out of Leroy and focus on God. Yeah. Yeah, that's what helped me. And I think, too, I had to, though it was never my intention, I had to grow and learn. I never viewed Leroy as a project, but I was paternalistic. I still am sometimes. I probably always will be sometimes. We all get paternalistic sometimes. But I had to learn. I don't know if some of you all white folks that live in the neighborhood, uh, black communities, I, when in the early years in Chicago there, uh, I'm a white guy living in a black neighborhood, and I see another white person coming in the neighborhood. I said, what's that person doing in my neighborhood? <laughs> what are they doing here? This is my neighborhood. I got possessive. I got possessive. That, I remember those feelings. If you got those feelings, let's pray that God will get them out of you. They need to get out of you. And um, when it, it, when, as I came to St. Louis, you know, the promise keeper thing continues to go. Promise keepers has been a wonderful thing. I remember the first few years we would go to Promise Keepers. I remember sitting in Indianapolis and we're sitting up in the balcony here. There goes the water. We're sitting up in the balcony and Leroy's sitting by me and he was not my black guy, okay? But that's kind of how I still felt. And uh, I remember uh, uh, some other white folks kind of absconding him from me. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And I thought, he's my friend. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, he's and my black friend. My black friend. Yeah, he can't not, be your friend. No, no, he's my friend, my black friend. And uh, it was really good at that, and really good because I recognized that and I said, oh my goodness, this has got to get out of me. Because he's not just my black. He, and problem in America is there's not enough black people to go around for all you white people, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. John, John Perkins just said uh, that he's starting a rental service, if anyone would like to rent. So, well, now, uh, obviously, uh, now, I done lost control of this meeting, JP. Uh, 
Leroy, you, you left the county, moved in. You all moved, live within a block of each other and, and live very close. And obviously, Andy, you're married to Debbie and a long relationship and marriage with several children. And you and Donna are married. And the same thing for the two of you. Um, l- let's talk a little bit about with two men that are so intentional about having a loving and a committed relationship as you two have. Let's bring the families in, the wives. Obviously, your wives have bought into this. Talk a little bit about that. Talk to us a little bit about Donna. What'd she think about this white man that was getting in and taking some of her time away from you, Leroy? Um, Did she like Andy at first? Not at first. Uh Uh Uh-huh, okay. Uh, (laughs) Again, once we begin to learn the principles, the principles of relocation... uh, not only uh, there were people who were really trying to push us. I was ready. Yeah. But my wife wasn't ready. And so uh, we had to wait two years for Donna. Yeah. Uh, because and Andy I, was in a hurry and Andy pushing? Just Donna have to tell that story. And Donna would say, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I see Donna out here. Uh, yeah, yeah. She said, yeah, Andy was pushy. Yeah, okay. Andy was pushy. She's saying it. All Along right. with some other white folks. Yeah. Okay. But I had to wait on my wife because I knew if, it, if, it, uh, if we were going to be successful, she had to be, you know, on 100%. Uh, so uh, December 26th, uh, right before Christmas, she said, I'm, gonna, I'm going, but... If you don't move before Christmas, I'm not going. (laughs) So here Donna's leading the charge. God spoke to her heart Mm. about about moving down. Uh, So I hope I answered the question. Yeah, Andy? Donna led the charge after after a while. And as as far as Debbie goes, I mean, Debbie grew up as a missionary kid in Africa. And when we moved to Lawndale years ago, we moved with a two-year commitment. And the inner city America was the farthest thing from Debbie's reality. She grew up in rural Africa. And uh, we thought we were headed back there as missionaries. Um, And so when we made a commitment to Lawndale for a couple of years, she thought, I can do anything for two years. But then in that whole process, um, God began to grip her heart further and further for the urban situation in America. And the African-American community in particular has been our call. And then when we moved to St. Louis, the morning that I knew we were supposed to go to St. Louis, I thought, oh, I don't know if I can tell Debbie yet. I don't know why I thought that, because we always talk about things and everything. But I thought, I got to tell her. And I told her right away. And it was in her heart. God hadn't said something to her, but she knew in her heart we were going to St. Louis. And Mm -hmm. it's been a a good partnership Mm -hmm. the whole time. Andy, from from a white perspective, what are two or three things that you know are so important and that you've learned from Leroy and your relationship that you think would just be good for all of us as white people to know? What are two or three things that are helping you to really have a solid relationship with Leroy? Uh, One is, um, and Leroy's helped me know this better, I've learned it along the way as well. Um, For those of you out there that don't know, many of you do know, Uh, Black folks have to live in two worlds every day. Um, They have to be bicultural. And white folks live in a monocultural kind of world. And black folks understand us white folks a whole lot more than we think they do. And they understand us white folks a whole lot better than we understand them. Okay? It's just that's the way it is. Whether you believe it or not, I, I, I... I'll fight you for it. I believe that's true. White folks just do not understand black folks nearly as good as black folks. So how does that relate? What are you saying? What I'm saying then is I pay a lot more attention to Leroy because I understand he has a discerning spirit in him that I don't have. Okay. He understands agendas and people's things. I I just think, I just trust everybody. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. We're just going to do this, you know, and and it's not a naivete and all that kind of thing, but it's just natural to me because I've grown up with Officer Friendly. Yeah. Okay? They didn't grow up with Officer Friendly. All right. 
They grew up with the officers that, believe it or not, white people, the officers sometimes plant drugs on people, okay? Yeah. That yeah. kind of stuff. They have that perspective. I never knew that. So I have to listen so you're, more. So you listen, listen so more. being a listener and actually being a learner in the relationship. Yeah. Is there something else that maybe you think is important that why you guys have been able to be friends now for a dozen years and you're still doing well? I think because one of the reasons is in the early years, I kept pinching myself. Can this really happen? Is this really possible that we can keep going? And even in the early years, sometimes somebody would want to do a little newspaper article or a magazine thing. And no, I, I was a, I, like you were mentioned, I protected us a little bit. I didn't want to say anything five years, six years, seven. That's not very long. Five years, you know, you can do anything for a few years. Yeah. But we're over 10 years now, and we don't know if we'll be together forever, but we know that it's, it's real. It's yeah. real. Yeah. And so... Okay. The, just stay in, stay in communication. Yeah. I mean, even the reality that it's working was somewhat of a surprise to you because it is hard to make it. You see so many things break up. So yeah. many things break up. Yeah. Leroy, how about from your perspective? Uh, what, do you have a, one or two, three things maybe that you believe is why you and Andy are having a good relationship? What are a couple keys? Well, we need each other. Okay. We need each other especially in my community, uh, our relationship, I, I often remind Andy, just his white skin alone, him moving into the community spoke volume. It speaks volume to people that he would make a commitment like that. Uh, St. Louis would is so divided. We need more models like that. Uh, Cross-cultural models. Um, and so, and again, the, the tremendous blessing really is the result of what has happened. Yeah. I know from a human, from a, as Paul said, let me speak in human terms, uh, that a lot of things that has gone on in our community in connection with, with white folks, it would not have happened the way it had if Andy if God didn't call Andy to that community to connect white folks to black folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and why, why are you and Andy still committed to each other? Why are you, why are you still committed to Andy? The, the call is not done yet. Yeah. God hasn't given us a clear yeah. answer that it's over. And in fact, I think it's just beginning. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think so. I think so. Well, the, you two really, you know, I, you epitomize really what CCDA is about. It's about multiracial commitment to each other. It's about a church and a community outreach ministry and a development corporation loving its community. You both have relocated. You both live in the community. And your relationship is what we've been talking about today. And it's so significant. And I, I just say as someone that has been watching you for these last dozen years and been in and out of your lives and you've been up to Chicago, I would just say it's been such a joy to watch the two of you. You've really uh, been doing it right. And that's why we wanted to talk with you today. And I know we've only, we've, you know, just scratched the surface of what's going on inside of you. And uh, I, I'm sorry we couldn't get deeper in the amount of time we had. But you, you gave us, thank you for your vulnerability. Thank you for your honesty with us today. And let, let's give them a, a wonderful round of applause. Now, when Andy and Leroy and I, and, and, and this was not scripted, as you can see, and we were praying God would help us get to the issues, but as we were, there was one part that we felt strongly, all three of us, but we thought we wanted to end this time with just a little bit of prayer. And what we'd like to do is, John was talking about making a commitment this morning out of Isaiah, you know, who shall I send? 
here I am, send me. So what we would like to do is if you are in a relationship with somebody of a different race and cross-cultural, and you would like to, we're going to invite you to come to the front. And I'm going to ask Andy and Leroy to pray for you. But if, you're, if you have a, re, a relationship like that now that you came to CCDA together, come down front. If you uh, are, are committed to a relationship like that, come on. If maybe you're here and your partner is back home, we would love for you to come down to receive this prayer. Uh, if you uh, hope to be in a relationship, you're looking for somebody that you could partner with in that way, just come on. Any of you that are here that desires what Andy and Leroy have been modeling for us, uh, we invite you to come. You want this. You're in relationship. You have one back home. We just invite you to come. It's so beautiful to see you coming. So just keep coming if you, as this is a desire of your heart. And when you come, you're making a commitment that, like Andy and Leroy have made, that, that you want to. Be in a relationship with somebody. If you already are there, you're committed to make that. So as you're here, we're just going to uh, just stretch out our hands, and Andy is going to pray, and then Leroy is going to pray for you. So let's, let's pray together. You might grab somebody's hand that's here, and uh, somebody out there, come grab my hand so we are all kind of together. All right, Andy and Leroy, let's pray for our brothers and sisters who've come to be in this committed type of relationship. God, this is no joke. This is for real. This is a heartbeat. This is what you're calling us to, God. You're calling us to authentic relationships. Mm -hmm. You've got to go through a lot of pain, God. Yes. We don't want to go through pain. We don't like pain. But we know we got to go through it, God. And there are people out here today, Lord, that uh, something didn't work right. Mm. And their hearts are hurt. Mm. The first time that it tried, or maybe the second time they tried, or whatever. God, heal the hurts, please. God, there are some that are just uh, dreaming about an idea of working cross culturally, working across the races, and being a Example of John chapter 17, the unity of the body of Christ. Lord, would you please, please give, those, give our brothers and sisters wisdom here across black and white or Hispanic and Asian and uh, Latino and black and white and Asian. And you can talk about all the other different colors out there, Lord. You, you are doing this, God. Yes, it's Lord. obvious. Yes, Lord. People wouldn't get up if they're not real about this hmm. thing. And so, Lord, the people that are dreaming about it, Lord, the people that are just starting the relationships. Lord, the people that are in the midst of them right now, and there's hard times. Yes. The hard times don't go away. We've got to keep working through them, Jesus. Give us the wisdom. Give us the peace. Give us the perseverance and the strength and the yes. courage, God. Mm -hmm. Courage, again, not the absence of fear, mm -hmm. but the way to deal with it, to manage it, to go through it, God. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. So I just pray for my brothers and sisters. Impart to them your wisdom, your understanding, and your strength, please. Yes. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, we, we bless you. And Lord, we, uh, I don't think it was an accident that you changed Dr. Perkins' message today. Mm -hmm. It's right at the heart of what we're talking about, God. We need a fresh view of Calvary. Yes. God, show us Calvary, pain, what it took for our Savior to bring forth forgiveness and grace and mercy and love toward us, even while we were yet sinners. Yes. Christ died for us. Now, God, I pray that you would make it clear what you're calling us mm -hmm, to. Mm -hmm. Father, that we would not um, abandon the call. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. One day we're going to have to stand before you yes. and give an account of our stewardship. Yes. And we don't want to have gone to the left when you told us to go right. 
And Father, I pray not only do you remind us of Calvary, but remind us of the empty tomb. Mm. You are alive. Yes. Holy Spirit, bring fresh, a fresh mm. anointing mm. upon our lives so that we can walk with you. We ask it all in the precious and wonderful name of Jesus. Mm. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. All right. Some of you may have uh, gotten a card on your seat, and those were provided on the uh, on our behalf courtesy of Burning Bush Creations, please go visit their table right outside after this. We also have a giveaway. Um, is there a youth worker here, or a, a children's ministry or youth worker here from St. Louis? All right, if you're from St. Louis, I want to give this away to you. This is full of books and free stuff from Burning Bush. Also, if you buy a hundred bucks worth of stuff from um, Burning Bush, they will give you a hundred bucks worth of stuff for free. So it's basically a two-for-one deal. All right. Where are the youth workers at? Youth workers, make some noise. All right. If you are a youth worker and you've never heard of Lecrae or Tadashi or Trip Lee, you need to come on up here. I have five CDs courtesy of Reach Records, and they are giving them away right now. First five. Oh, gosh, gosh. All right, one each, one each, one each. All right. All right, so please go visit Reach Records downstairs. I have some quick announcements. If you are signed up for the tour of St. Louis, the buses will be leaving at 12 p.m. Hold tight, though, because the buses will wait for you. But if you want to grab a lunch, the kiosks are open, and um, you can cut on ahead to the front of the line and grab your lunch and meet downstairs by the horses. Also, for the ministry tours, they will be leaving at 2.30, also meet by the horses downstairs, 2.30 sharp for the ministry tours. All right. I, I need to do this. All right. All right. Um, one more announcement. Or actually, a couple more. A new workshop has been added. It was in a daily voice yesterday, but it was printed wrong. Um, it's in Director's Row 29, and the workshop is entitled Healthy Communication problem-solving skills that bless marriages, churches, and communities. So it's not just for married folks. That's at 245. All right, and if your name is Ernestine Skiffer, Juliana Osuna, or Akinet Kennedy, please go back to the St. Louis Christian College bookstore booth downstairs. They had a problem with your credit card, so you need to go there. Um, also, if you are driving a Lincoln MKX registered to PV Holding, uh, please go see the hotel front desk. The St. Louis Police Department is looking for you. I know there's some uh, shady people here. All right. And of course, it wouldn't be a conference if we didn't offer you a chance to win a free iPod. Um, your feedback is very important to us, so please go to the information booth, pick up uh, an evaluation, fill it out, return it there, and we will do a drawing tonight for a free iPod Nano. <coughs> also, a lot of you have been asking about whether or not Foster has a CD available. Unfortunately, they do not, but you can check out their MySpace page and download some of their music, um, and hopefully we can have that available soon, maybe at the next conference. <coughs> Please remember to go visit the Dove table right outside. You can pick up DVDs and CDs of our workshops and main sessions. Um, and go, please uh, visit the rest of the exhibits. They, they, they're feeling kind of lonely now, so please go show them some love. <clears throat> All right, see you back here at 6.30. Don't miss out on Ephraim Smith and Phil Jackson. They're going to bring down the house tonight. <laughs> <laughs>